One of the ways that we love to talk about God is about his love. That God is a God of love, that God loves us. Um, you know, we just love to talk about this, this aspect of God because, you know, it, it gives us the, uh, the great feelings of being loved, of being in relationship with God. And, uh, you know, us as people, and as a culture, we're looking for love, and, and even our culture holds love as one of the highest virtues. Uh, but yet, as we think about God's love, um, you know, we really don't have a good grasp of what this love actually is and actually means. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, one of the very popular worship songs nowadays is Reckless Love, where, you know, it's a, I mean, it comes from the Bible passage about uh, Jesus with the sheep, and he says that, you know, gives the parable of a shepherd leaving the 99 sheep and going after the one that's lost, and he, he sings about the reckless love of God. But I, I, I really have issue with that word reckless because if you look, up, look it up in a dictionary, say uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the definition of reckless is irresponsible. That it is a, uh, and so if you take that definition and put it in the song, um, you're, you're describing God's love, you're praising God's love as a love that is irresponsible. Uh, a love that doesn't care about consequences or costs. Um, I think that's maybe what he's getting at. He doesn't care about the cost, uh, but that's not all that word irresponsible means. And so I don't think irresponsible is a proper way to describe God's love because God's love is not careless. It's not irresponsible. Looking at the Bible, I think, gives us a better words to describe it with. And uh, if you were here uh, for Wednesday uh, Bible study, we were, we were studying Isaiah, you know, about four chapters in Isaiah. And one of the things that really struck me was, was the description of God's love. And the description was stubbornness. And it starts out by describing Israel as stubborn. God is, is, is saying, Israel, you are stubborn, your heart of heart. They're stubborn in their sin. But yet God says he has not forgotten them. He is going to move ahead with his plan of salvation, regardless of whether his people turn to him first or not. God is going to be stubborn to save God is stubborn to love. And this is what we call faithfulness. This is why God's stubbornness is great and our stubbornness is bad because we are stubborn to sin. We are stubborn to uh, walk away from God. We're stubborn uh, to ignore God. But yet God is even more stubborn, Isaiah says. He is stubborn to love. And that is a wonderful message uh, that even though we may be stubborn in our sin, our stubbornness will never overcome the stubbornness of God when it comes to love. And the Bible has a special word for this. It's the word has said, which in the King James is translated uh, loving kindness. Uh, but the ESV, today we're going to be looking at a psalm that translates it, steadfast love. And it describes this kind of love that is faithful, loyal, that is stubborn, shall we say. A stubborn love. It doesn't sound as great in English as it does in Hebrew, where you just summarize it with one word, has said, and it you know means all these things. Uh, but this is a description of God's love. It is a, it is a love that is stubborn, a love that is faithful, a love that chases after the one, the object of his love and, uh, and rescues and, and sacrifices and acts on behalf of the one 
that God loves. So let's read the psalm. This morning we're going to be doing Psalm 107. It's actually the, the first psalm of the fifth book of Psalm. So I don't know if in your Bible it may be labeled Book 5. So we're kind of starting in this new book of Psalms. And it starts with Psalm 107. Let me read it for us. And then we'll pray for God's understanding and his blessing. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So they bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. Some went down to the ships, to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heaven, they went down to the depths, their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them give thank, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste, because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright seat and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we dig into this psalm this morning, indeed, let us uh, consider, let us meditate upon your steadfast love lord let us glory in what that means for us let us rejoice in the god that saves us 
because of his steadfast love toward us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've noticed in the reading, the psalmist gives four examples of God's steadfast love, of God's salvation. Because it starts out with a call to worship. This is a psalm, like many other psalms, like the one we did uh, just last week, that calls us, calls Christians, calls believers to worship him and then tells us why. The why is his steadfast love endures forever. Because he has redeemed us from trouble. He has, verse 3, gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. There's a picture of God rescuing people from the ends of the earth. That God's steadfast love, his stubborn love toward us is in effect to all uh, points of the compass. No matter where you are in the world and no matter what circumstances you're in, no matter what trouble you're in, no matter what pit you're in, no matter what you're going through, God's steadfast love reaches in and rescues. And because God's steadfast love comes and finds everyone that is lost, everyone who has wandered, everyone who is uh, in prison, everyone, no matter what their circumstances. Therefore, the psalmist calls his people to give thanks to the Lord. Not only to give thanks, verse 2, let the redeemed the Lord say so. This is a psalm not for everyone. This is a psalm for the redeemed. This is a psalm for those whose lives God has worked in. Those are, this is a psalm for those who have experienced God's steadfast uh, love toward us. And we are called to rejoice. We are called to say so. We are called to testify to God's steadfast, faithful, enduring, stubborn love. And so because uh, he's mentioned that God's steadfast love reaches out to people no matter what direction they're in, what circumstance they're in, you know, represented by the four cardinal directions of the compass, north, south, east, west, he gives four different examples. And maybe they're connected to the different points of the compass. Uh, I don't know. There have been some, at least I found one commentary that does connect them. Uh, but it seems a little forced. <laughs> uh, but maybe the connection was clearer to them uh, back when back when it was written. But we know that there, there's four cardinal directions, and, and that just means that God's steadfast love seeks out and rescues his redeemed from any location. So it doesn't matter where they are, doesn't matter what they're going through, God's steadfast love finds them, pursues them stubbornly. And so to illustrate this, the psalmist now brings up four examples of how God's steadfast love chases after different people. And so you can see they all start with that same word, some. All right, so some go through this, some go through that, uh, and let's just go through these some and, and, and see what it says and see how it relates to us. Verse 4, some wandered in desert places, desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. God's steadfast love, like the parable that Jesus told about uh, chasing down the one lost sheep, God chases down faithfully, stubbornly, those who wander in desert places. Wandering in desert places is tough work because there's no, uh, not only is there no roads, but there's no set places to 
get what you need. Water, <laughs> water primarily, uh, but food, rest, shade, none of that. If you travel a road, you know, you'll know at certain points there's an oasis. At certain points there's a city. At, cer at certain points there's shade. Um, but when you wander in, in desert wastes, when you wander off the road, you don't know when the next time there's going to be water. You don't know the next time there's going to be shade. You don't know if there's any towns nearby. And so there's a picture of someone wandering in a state of lostness. They cried out to Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them in their distress. And they don't have any hope. They don't know, they don't have anyone else to depend on. They turn to God and they cry out to him. And the Lord delivers them from their trouble. Verse 6 and 7. And so the call is, let them thank the Lord. Actually, this is the, the call uh, that ends in all of them. You know, all of these four things have this verse in them exactly the same. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Uh, and this may envision physically someone who's actually lost, but we know that you know spiritual lostness is an even greater problem and even more widespread. And so all of us who are redeemed, we know this. We have experienced this. The, the hymn writer who wrote, uh, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, the third, third stanza, says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. The, the hymn writer knows that feeling within himself, as, as we all do, that, that even though we desire to follow God, even though we love him, even though he has saved us from sin by Jesus' death on the cross, at, at the cost of the, the life of his own dear son, yet our hearts are prone to wander. That even though on Sunday we may be elated and we may be worshipful and, and our hearts just want to praise God with our whole being, you know, Monday comes along with its work, with its school, with you know everything, with temptations, and then suddenly our hearts, like you know, a heart that wasn't Sunday was like. Yeah, all oh God. Then uh, you know, on Monday, our hearts like, you know, our hearts like kind of looking to God, and then like peeking around, like, oh, what's that? Oh, look at all that other stuff. It's prone to wander. It it doesn't stay focused on God, and and so the hymn hymn writers, you know, ask for God to take our hearts and seal it for our for His courts above. Take our hearts and, and and keep it on you, Lord, so I don't wander off. All of us know this redeeming power of God. All of us wander. All of us wandered before we knew Christ, but even after Christ, our heart still is is double minded. Our hearts still want things other than God, uh, and so we know the redeeming, faithful stubborn love of God that even when we wander, the Lord still keeps on bringing us back. That is not just that uh, that God leaves the 99 sheep to look for the one lost one and brings them back and then that's the end of the story and they'll live happily ever after. You know, even after that, us as, as sheep just still kind of wander off even after we've been rescued, even after we've been brought back. And Jesus is constantly having to, like, hey, no, no, come back here. Come back here. Come back into the flock. You know, that, that grass might look, you know, really nice and tasty, but that's not good for you. It's filled with pesticides, uh, <laughs> whatnot. You know, it's dangerous over there. You know, come back, come back, come back into the flock. And, and that is part of God's faithful, stubborn love that he, he's always drawing us back to himself who are wandering. And so we praise God for that. And the call is, um, let them thank God for his steadfast love. Praise God for your steadfast love. Second example, verse 10, some sat in darkness and the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. God's faithful, steadfast, Stubborn love rescues prisoners. 
He does rescue people in prison physically, um, but primarily, at least for now, um, he rescues those in prison uh, in bondage because of spiritual sin. Um, it says, because they spurned, they rebelled God, they rebelled against the words of God. And this is what happens to everyone before uh, God saves them by the power of Christ. They are all in bondage because the Bible says no one seeks after God. No one seeks after God. And so therefore, we are all in bondage. We're all in bondage to sin. We're all in bondage to self. We're all in bondage to the, the ways of this world, to money, to power, to lust, to materialism. And God's steadfast, faithful, uh, stubborn love goes into the prison to find us. Even though, verse 12, they bowed their hearts down with hard labor, they fell down with none to help. This, this describes the prison of sin. This describes the, the, the shackles and, and the bondage that we're under before God rescues us. Verse 13, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. God finds us in the prison. God finds us in bondage. God finds us when we're locked up in the strongholds of Satan, whether it's, you know, uh, captive, captivity to materialism or to video games or to porn or to gluttony or whatever it may be, to pride God saves us. He brought them out of darkness, verse 14, and the shadow of death, and burst their bonds apart. Let them, the call comes again, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Oh, praise God. Verse 17, some were fools through their sinful ways and because their iniquities suffered affliction. Uh, this is talking about uh, physical illness or even mental or emotional illness. It's talking about you know, the, the illness that we feel in this physical world. Verse 18, they load any kind of food. Uh, when you're sick or even mentally sick, maybe especially when you're mentally sick, when you're when you're just totally stressed out, when you know you just yeah you're just under the cloud of depression, you don't even feel like eating. Like that 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 just gives you no joy. As as they drew near to the gates of death, and that this illness is not life affirming. It's life killing. It's life snuffing out. I know that, that's a horrible word. Um, my English teachers are, are being mad at me right now. Um, but stress and physical, emotional, um, spiritual disease and illness, it has this effect on us. Yet, they cried to the Lord, verse 19, in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. God's faithful, steadfast, uh, stubborn love finds us in our clouded oppression. He finds us in, in our sick beds. He finds us when we're stressed out. He finds us in the hospital. He finds us in, uh, you know, when we have fever. He finds us when we have COVID. He finds us and he delivers us from our distress. Verse 20, he sent his, out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Verse 21, again, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works, the children of man. Verse 23, some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord as wondrous works in the deep. 
For he commanded and raised the stormy winds, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Uh, this is a picture of sailors that are on the sea and a storm comes up. You know, this is a picture of, uh, of man facing circumstances and situations that are beyond their control where they just yeah, they just that they face things that they have no control over whether it's waves of the sea whether it's a broken down economy whether it's losing jobs whether it, you know it's uh, you know losing family losing their home losing livelihood uh, this is this is people that are up to their necks and and beyond <laughs> drowning in a sea of despondency by circumstances that are out of control and yet it says they see the deeds of the lord his wondrous works and they see the power of god working in their circumstances and they cry out to Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed they and they were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to the desired haven God's faithful steadfast stubborn love comes and finds us when the storms are raging when the waters are gonna spill over us when we're drowning under a mountain of debt, when we're drowning under circumstances beyond our control, that we feel powerless and hopeless in, God's love finds us there. And the call comes again one last time. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Verse 33 comes a little section which it feels out of place. And so some, uh, you know, some academic people think, you know, this is not part of the psalm. There's some other part that just kind of stitched on here. No, but this makes total sense. And you'll see why in a little, a little minute. Uh, he turns the rivers into desert springs of water, into a thirsty land, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of his inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks, the upright seed and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Now, at first, it seems like um, a statement on the sovereignty of God which it is. He's turning rivers in a desert, desert in rivers, uh, bringing up the humble, bringing down the high. Uh, you know, we don't, it's not clear at first how this connects with the steadfast love of the Lord finding us in our distress and rescuing us. But it ends with the upright will see and are glad and all wickedness shuts his mouth Therefore, okay, the therefore is not there, but whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast law of the Lord. Whoever is wise. Therefore, I'm thinking, right? So the wise people attend to these things. They think about and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. The opposite is, therefore, whoever does not think about these things, Whoever is, does not remember and consider the steadfast, faithful, stubborn love of God is a fool. Why? How does that connect with the sovereignty of God? How does that connect with verse 33 to 42? 
well, it connects with how stubborn God's love is. This section is describing the extents that God will go through to love his people. This is an example of the stubborn love, the faithful and steadfast love of God. To, to find us in, our, in, in wherever we are, and, and these four examples are, you know, they could be, you know, four different people, four different examples of people that God has saved. But, you know, we're also supposed to find ourselves in all of these as we use this psalm as worship. We, we worship and we sing, well, at least they would have sung it. We read it. We read it and, and we're, we're to see that, yes, what, how God works in this situation for those who wander, those who are in prison, those who are in uh, sickness, those who are in trouble. Uh, we're supposed to see ourselves in that and, and see, oh, yes, God works in those situations. Or maybe when we go through those things, we, we realize, oh, God can work in this situation. And so, therefore, I need to call out to God. Or if we hear other people go through these things and we give praise to God because he, his steadfast love endures forever. And so we, we turn to this last section and we realize how much God does on our behalf. And I think that's, that's what that song, The Reckless Love of God, is trying to get to, even though I don't you know, agree with that word reckless. But you know, I agree with the extent, the amazing uh, heights and depths and deeps and lengths that God will go through to love us. The amount of stubbornness, shall we say, that God employs to love us when we wander, when we're in, in bondage, when, when we're sick, and when we're despondent, and when we're in trouble. He, he'll turn rivers dry, he'll turn dry into river, <laughs> he'll bring, you know, he'll, he'll, you know, bring the, the humble up, he'll bring the high down, he'll, you know, these are, it's just a list of, a picture of the extent that God will show his love. We, we have another, you know, kind of this in another way of wording this in Romans chapter 8. Uh, and this is the New Testament way of saying this. Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger of the sword? As is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what this last section is pointing to. It's giving us an illustration of things that cannot stand in the way of God's faithful, steadfast, stubborn love. Nothing can get in the way of God showing his love to us. And so therefore, the psalmist can say, whoever is wise, you, know, you think you're wise, you think you're smart, you think you know what's going on. Uh, if you know what the love of God looks like, if you know the extent, if you know the things that God will go through to love you, you are going to think, your mind is going to be concentrated, it's going to be considering, it's going to be meditating, it's going to be rejoicing in the steadfast love of God. And so that is why the call to worship is there. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, 
for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. There's a call to praise, to worship. There's a call to testify. Let the redeemed Lord say so. Verse 2. Uh, verse, uh, verse 22. And let him offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell his, of his deeds in songs of joy. Verse 32. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. If we know... And not just academically know, but if we know and have experienced, if we know that God's love is this hesed, faithful, steadfast, stubborn kind of love, you know, not reckless, not irresponsible. If this is what God's love looks like, then our response should be praise, worship. It should be testimony that we should tell others about God's love, that we should praise him in the congregation, we should praise him to other people, that we, the redeemed, should say so, and that we should ponder it, we should consider it. Our minds should be full of the steadfast love of the Lord. This is the response. If we know what God's love looks like, and I hope as we've gone through this psalm, uh, we've we've gotten a better picture of what God's love actually is. Uh, you know that is not just a, a romantic feeling kind of love. That it is it is a love of action. It's a love of sacrifice. It's a love that went so far as to send His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for your sins. That's that doesn't happen because of a feeling. That doesn't happen because of an irresponsibleness of love. That happens because God's love is faithful, steadfast. It's stubborn to love us, even when we don't love him, even when we're his enemies. So let's praise God for his steadfast love. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that your love is not just a feeling, it's not reckless, it's not irresponsible, um, it's not just you know, a fluttering of butterflies. Lord, your love is steadfast, it's faithful, it's stubborn. To break through any barriers, to break through any chains, to break through anything that comes in the way, to show us your love. To redeem us from whatever troubles we're in, uh, even those troubles, and especially those troubles that we dig in for ourselves because of our sin. We thank you that your love sought us out, that your love found us. And that your love rescued us. And so because of your steadfast love, oh Lord, we give you our praise. We testify to the congregation. We testify to the nations. We fill our minds and our hearts, considering and meditating on your love day and night. So we give you our praise. Uh, fill us with this kind of love. Let us see this kind of love always working on our behalf uh, throughout the week and throughout our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.